So what's exciting about these Communities Create projects is that we're wanting to really bring people together in this time where we're all apart. Be part of a time capsule of life during the pandemic through creative outputs. Hi everyone, I'm Ramona Pringle. I am the director of the Creative Innovation Studio at FCAT at Ryerson University. And welcome to another Communities Create workshop. Um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces, people who have been with us for many, many sessions now. I think I've lost count, but I think we're, my, I've lost count, I have to admit it, but it's been a couple of months. It's really amazing. Along the way, we have collaborated with so many wonderful organizations from across the country, which has really been tremendous to be able to work with people in different communities from coast to coast. Uh, we're now streaming on CBC Art, so it's been great to have their support as well and reach new people. So I know that there's people who are not only in our live interactive session right now, there's people who are streaming on the uh, Communities Create website through YouTube and people who are streaming through CBC Art as well. So hi to everyone and welcome. A little bit of background information because I know every week there's new people as well. That's part of what's so wonderful about collaborating with these different organizations is that they've got community members who join in as well and learn about what we're doing. So if you are new to Communities Create, a little bit of background on all of this. Um, when we were early in on the lockdown, on quarantine life, we wanted to find a way of supporting independent members of the creative community. Um, and also understanding that we could um, leverage those creatives, that those creative, that creative community had a way of really helping Canadians and uniting Canadians um, to express how we're feeling in this time of uncertainty and pandemic. So much has been going on. Uh, and certainly sometimes words aren't enough. And that's what we've seen week to week through the creative output is just how incredible it is to have these various tools. Um, what we've done in terms of the structure with Communities Create is provide micro grants to these independent artists to lead these wonderful workshops and they're interactive. Um, so we've got this wonderful network of partners. Today, it's the ROM and Inkwell that are joining us. Um, the the um, workshop today is from collection to creation. Uh, so it is using the incredible um, collection of the ROM, and it's also with Inkwell Workshop, so it's object-based writing. It's a really great session with Leanne uh, Toshiko Simpson. Some ground rules before we get started, uh, just to make sure that everyone has the best possible experience. The first thing that I'll say, this is the most important thing, because these are interactive sessions, is try the exercises yourself. You'll see that there is time that is uh, designed within the workshop for you to try things. And the best experience is when you just go and try. Um, I want to say hi to everyone again who's in all the various streams. If you're participating uh, inside of the stream, you can engage by asking questions and using the chat to comment and ask questions. Your microphone is gonna be muted and the moderators will unmute you if you've got a question to ask, just so that you know any audio is recorded and archived. Your video is controlled by you and it is viewable by other participants, but it's not being recorded. So no one in the stream can see your video. Uh, but I do encourage you if you're inside of this Zoom call right now to keep your video on because it's nice to see everyone's faces as everyone is participating in this. If you're in the live stream right now, uh, you can still introduce yourself. Use Twitter, use um, the YouTube chat, use whatever platform you happen to be on. If you're using the Communities Create hashtag, we'll find what you're saying. So play along, ask questions. You can definitely engage, even if you're not right in the session with us right now. Now, um, one other piece of, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit this morning. It's that long weekend, got to, got to my head. My head is still in vacation mode. Um, one other piece, uh, one other tip for people who are inside of the session with us right now is that you want to pin the communities create video to have the best possible experience. So depending on the number of participants, sometimes it's a little bit hard to find the thumbnail. Scroll through till you see the thumbnail. It says communities create. You'll see in the top right, there's three little dots. And there you have the option to pin that video. And that way you'll see all of the instructions. You'll always see what it is that you're supposed to be seeing um, and you won't get lost. 
There are a bunch of people on this call. Um, there's Christian Blake, the inclusion manager at the Royal Ontario Museum. We've got our community engagement and tech team. Rachel Jewett is the clinical psychology PhD student from our well-being team who's joining us today. So before we get started, I think I'm just going to hand the virtual floor over to Rachel for a moment because one of the reasons we're doing this is to give people a creative output and creative outlet for their emotions. So Rachel, maybe you can just talk a little bit about your role here today. Hi everyone, it's an absolute pleasure to be joining you today. Um, so like Ramona said, my name is Rachel and my colleague Amy is here as well. Um, and the reason that we're here is that, you know, sometimes when we think about how we're feeling, it can trigger some more intense emotions. So our role is to be a safety net and support for anyone who might be feeling uncomfortable or distressed and want to talk about that briefly after the workshop. So we don't anticipate anyone will be terribly distressed by the content today, uh, but we just want to be there in case it does bring up some stuff for, for anyone. Um, so we're going to be available during the chat throughout the workshop, which we'll be monitoring, um, but also mainly during a 15 minute debrief just at the end of the workshop. Amy and I will stick around to talk to anyone who's interested. Um, and we also have a list of resources available on the community's Create website. Um, which we can help direct you to and tell you a little bit about as well. So thank you very much and hope you have a wonderful experience today. Thank you, Rachel. Now, before we get started with Leanne, I wanted to introduce Christian Blake, who made this happen, who helped uh, make this partnership come to life with Inkwell and the ROM. Uh, so Christian, maybe talk a little bit about your work at the Royal Ontario Museum and what you're most excited about in this session today. Sure, thanks Ramona. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Christian Blake and as Ramona mentioned, I work at the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, particularly with our community engagement portfolio. And I'm thrilled today uh, to be part of this experience with you all as we use the ROMS collections to spark uh, your creative process. But as we take some time today to discuss the museum's collections, I want to first acknowledge the traditional caretakers of the land where the ROM is located. Even though we are far flung in our digital space, the ROM building where our collections are housed sit on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. So as we get into this, I direct our intentions towards not only thinking about how we can connect with objects from the museum's collection, but also with the lands in which you all are occupying space at the moment. Um, the thing that excites me about this and particularly using objects as a jumping off point is, I mean, at the ROM, we have over 6 million objects, which is, a lot of stuff. Uh, but what makes those objects special is not when they're made or how much they cost, but it's the stories that we tell one another about them. Um, because every object has a story and more than one. Uh, it has the story that we as a museum might tell about it. It has the way that I might think about it and talk about it. And it has the way that all of you experience and share it. So in a lot of ways, the thing about objects is they're just tangible things that we tie our stories to. So what excites me about today and sharing these objects is it gets to spark your storytelling, um, your writing, your sharing, so that hopefully when all is said and done, they'll have your stories tied to them too. So guiding you today uh, will be Leanne Toshko Simpson, Leanne's a Yonsei writer from Scarborough living with bipolar disorder. She's a graduate of the University of Guelph's MFA program uh, where she was nominated for the Journey Prize in 2019 and named Scarborough's Emerging Writer in 2016. In addition to teaching at U of T and Ryerson, Leanne facilitates creative writing workshops at the ROM through Inkwell. And we've had the pleasure of working together over the last while. So I'm really excited to see what comes from all this today. So thank you. Leanne, I think I turn it over to you to get us going.
Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Christian. It's been a pleasure working with you. And hi, everyone. Um, I see some folks from Inkwell workshops and also some of my students from Guelph Humber. Really happy to have you all here and everyone I'm meeting for the first time. So uh, my name is Leanne and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a creative writing instructor for Inkwell workshops. Um, so Inkwell, if you haven't heard of it before, runs creative writing workshops for people with lived experience of Ill mental illness and addiction, uh, taught by professional writers who also share those same lived experiences. So it's a really nice kind of peer run model that uh, we've made a lot of great friendships through that. Uh, and I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, wow, like 10 years ago now. And uh, for me, writing has been uh, a way forward through uh, my process of recovery uh, and managing my illness. So I'm really excited to share the creative process with you today. And I look forward to reading some of your work uh, later this week. Um, so I guess uh, we can get right into it. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay, uh, so uh, I love object-based writing because objects can act as touchstones for memory. And since we all engage with writing from different historical and social intersections, our responses to different objects are really, really unique. Um, folks will look at uh, a skeleton of something and see so many different things in the shadows of its rib cage, uh, in the way that its eye sockets kind of stare at you. There, it's, there's a lot of uh, levels in there. And by exploring sensory details around these objects and also our more abstract connections to them, uh, a single object can inspire countless stories. And when we work with objects from places like the Royal Ontario Museum, there's kind of like an extra layer that's added to that. So not only are we finding inspiration uh, in these objects, but we're also learning about uh, their cultural significance in the communities from which they come from. And also uh, learning about the systems of power that affect those communities and the way that those objects um, are taught uh, to us. So as we move through the workshop, I hope you find echoes uh, in each of the items that help challenge your understandings of our collective histories and inspire you to build new connections through lived experience. And so as we mentioned before, the uh, theme of today's workshop is how are you feeling? And I think that is a really important question to ask during the pandemic. With all of the changes and disruptions of coronavirus, sometimes it kind of feels like we're floating through life and we don't have anything to hold on to. And I think objects are a really great way to kind of uh, work against that feeling and engage with how that makes us uh, feel in this world. So um, in addition to talking about uh, that effect on mental health, for those of us who are creative folks, I think it's also been maybe a little bit of a hard time to find inspiration. Uh, and so for me personally, building the workshops for the ROM that I've been doing for the last couple of weeks has been a great way to kind of break through that barrier. So I hope that you break through your own barriers uh, in our workshop today. So uh, a museum object can be a really great anchor for inspiration because uh, it's an opportunity for us to learn something new. I hope you learn something new today. I know every time I build the workshop, I think I know something about an object and then I learn 10 more things and I tell all my friends. They're like, Leanne, you love working too much. Um, and it's also a way for us to balance our own conceptions, uh, emotions and responses off something tangible. And uh, it's a way for us to connect to the lived experience of other inhabitants of our Earth. Although we don't have personal experience that connects to every single object uh, in the museum, there are ways that the, in those objects make communities feel uh, that we can identify with. And so when we're looking at our two objects from the ROMS collection today, I want you to think about first how they make you feel, and two, how uh, these objects and the experiences attached to them um, uh, connect to you in your writing in some way, shape, or form. So it's an opportunity to respond and care through creation. So uh, our two museum objects today, I, I think, are very, very different, but are really, really cool. So each object has inspired a writing prompt. 
the first uh, writing prompt focuses on character and the second one focuses on um, setting. So you'll be given five minutes to work on each prompt and then we'll finish uh, the workshop with the final prompt that ties this together through conflict. And at that point, I hope you'll have, you know, enough pieces of the puzzle so that you'll be able to weave a larger story on your own time that maybe you want to come back and share with me on Friday. I love hearing what people uh, come up with uh, from the same objects. It's kind of like a prism. Everyone uh, sees it kind of through a different light. And so I'm really excited to hear what you have to, uh, what you've put together on Friday. So uh, all you need for this workshop is a pen, some paper, and an open mind. And uh, that's pretty much it. So does anyone have any questions before we get started? I think we're okay then. It's a, not a super complicated materials list. Um, so we're going to move to our first object. So if we can pen, paper, and open mine. Yeah, that's what we've got. And we also need a dodo. Oh, there it is. Uh, so this is a dodo skeleton found in Mauritius, uh, three miles from Mahaburg. Uh, it was collected in 1865 and acquired by the ROM in 1938 in a very interesting way. So we're going to talk about that as well. So if I were to kind of look at this object, um, it's sometimes uh, when we look at objects, it's helpful to think about our five senses. So what do we see? Smell, touch, taste, although I imagine you wouldn't want to lick this dodo skeleton. So there's that uh, and here. And obviously through the virtual kind of uh, nature of our workshops, we can't do all of these, but things that I might think about is kind of the sharpness of the ribs, the, the curve of its neck, um, the way that its feet are kind of like very, in a very active pose, like they look like they're ready to run. Um, and if, I don't know how much you know about the dodo, but the dodo is an extinct flightless bird that was only found on this island. Um, and it was uninhabited by humans for a really long time, which is why Mauritius had such unique uh, wildlife in both animals and plants. Uh, but in the 1500s, it was colonized, which eventually led to the extinction of the dodo within 200 years. And colonization is an important thing to talk about when we're looking at museum objects, because um, a lot of the objects come into place through those systems of oppression. And for the dodo, it really did contribute to the reason why it is in the museum as a skeleton in the first place. So. Um, the dodo is kind of like the poster child of extinction uh, due to human interference. So while modern scientists believe that, yeah, sailors definitely clubbed some dodos for food, um, the real reason why they might have gone extinct is that humans introduced other species that competed with the dodo. So pigs, monkeys, or rats that, ate, that um, competed with the dodo for food and ate their eggs. So um, the dodo uh, that we saw in the earlier slide um, is a composite skeleton. So this means that it's not one dodo there. It's a dodo kind of composed from a couple different um, dodo skeletons found uh, in a certain place. So uh, the bones that, that you saw in that last picture were largely found at the Merosange locality in Mauritius. And the skeleton was originally uh, put together by Sir Richard Owen, who is the person who invented the word dinosaur, but also someone who took credit for other people's work sometimes in paleontology, so not the best. Um, and it was originally purchased uh, by Harvard University. And then in 1938, the ROM was like, do you want to do a trade? We have this super sweet Ankyoceratops, and you have a dodo, and we would like to swap those. So. Um, that happened. And it's the only dodo skeleton in Canada. So that's pretty cool. Now, we, for a very famous bird, we don't actually know that much about uh, what the dodo was like. So a lot of early assumptions that were made based on journal entries from sailors and other things like that uh, painted a picture like the, the top picture here. Um, so this is a, 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 a painting of an imagining of a dodo from 1626. And in 2010, the photo uh, below is a more informed uh, picture of a dodo done by a paleontologist. So um, dodos were known for, you know, not being able to fly, not being able to evade prey, um, 
which was later determined that the dodos, I mean, were very brave and didn't really want to evade you. They wanted to stand their ground. So um, <laughs> kind of a, a fun contrast there. So we've learned a lot about uh, dodos over the years. Um, but what we do really know about the dodo is that it's a bird that defied, you know, many expectations of being a bird, like being able to fly, flying away from predators or trying to evade predators, a lot of bird-like behaviors. And um, while we don't know so much about its background, what we can do is kind of take that as a base for a character uh, that is interesting and unique. So for our first exercise, we are going to sketch a character who defies expectations of their own. So the first thing I want you to do is think about a specific community that your character uh, could belong to. So maybe they come from a long lineage of professional wrestlers, or maybe they come from a small uh, tight knit town. Maybe they're in a band, or maybe they've grown up with uh, certain superstitions that they've held their whole lives. The choice is up to you. So think about a, care, a community that they come from. The second step is we're going to ask ourselves, what unique trait makes this character stand out from their imagined community? Um, and so for, um, for instance, if you chose a professional wrestler, maybe, maybe they don't really like violence or maybe they wanna fight back against harmful wrestling personas. I don't know, it's very, it's very much up to you. Um, and the third step is in the voice of your character and considering their unique place in their community, write a response to the following question from someone in that community. So you're really leaving us. So you want to start with, so you're really leaving us and then write a response. You can have them think about what that means to them. You can have them answer the question in dialogue or you can think about the physical reaction that they might have to that prompt. So um, I'm going, the goal of the exercise is to write a character from both an individual and collective perspective, thinking about their values, responsibilities, and hopes for the future. So, so you're really leaving us. I'm going to give you five minutes uh, to write and give a warning when we're wrapping up. So it's 1225 now. At 12.30, uh, we're going to come back together.
minute. So just try to wrap up some of your thoughts. And if you didn't get to finish what you were working on, that's okay because all of these exercises are designed so that you can keep growing them outside of the workshop so that your creative inspiration doesn't stop after the workshop, it keeps going. So it's all right if you don't finish. Um, okay, so it's 12.30, so we'll come back together. Um, and just as an example, I'm going to share uh, what I put together. Um, so my character, um, her name is Nico, and she's a uh, mixed race coming from a small town hockey family. Uh, and she wants to leave uh, her small town and go to film school in the city. Uh, so this is the, the scene that I wrote, uh, starting from, so you're really leaving us. So you're really leaving us. Dad looks shrunken inside his North Bay Battalion jersey, drowning in the heavy mesh and glossy logo slicked to his chest. He put his beer down and looked at me expectantly. I let myself sink into the TV's roar. Brazo deked a stumbling defenseman. I wish there was a way to dodge this question from the opposition, at least until the third period buzzer blared. It's not leaving if I was never really here, I thought. The met his eyes. My dad always taught my brothers to finish their checks, and I guess it was my turn to do the same. Just because I'm moving doesn't mean I'll stop cheering for the home team, I said, even though I knew in many ways it did. So you can see in that scene, I work in some of the characters' backstory uh, into the conversation. When you, when you make a character sketch, it's very it's you can come up with so many details, and the character grows so big, and you can't always include all of them in your piece, and that's okay. It's good to have a knowledge of your character that extends outside of your work. Um, does anyone want to share in the chat? Uh, what their characters' qualities were or a line from their piece? You know, it takes a little time to write. You can just do, you can pick your favorite line or you can do just a brief synopsis of your idea. And that's okay if you don't feel like sharing yet either. It's uh, it's hard to get warmed up. And I think uh, thinking about character is a great way to get started uh, because so much natural conflict comes from within characters and who they are and where they came from and what their values are. Okay, well, if, uh, if no one is ready to share, that's okay. We can uh, keep moving and you can keep, oh, there we go, wow. So you're really leaving us. My lips pressed together in an attempt to keep myself from laughing in disbelief. The way that these girls could pretend to care was almost laughable, that I could see through her guise. Despite the question and the slight downwards tilt upon her lips, there was an optimistic ring to her voice, expectant. I wouldn't expect any less. I love the mirroring there. That's so nice. Uh, yes, I am, I say matter-of-factly. For years, I had been with these girls in class. We learned to dance across the floor, leap through the air as if weightless, turn dizzying circles of our feet without falling, together. But they always seemed part of this clique, and I was never given the ticket to enter. No, they didn't care at all. I love that so much. There's so much rich movement 
in the kind of the synopsis of what these girl how these girls interacted with each other and I think really there's a, a strong connection between the choreography of belonging and the choreography of dance I really like how you were able to tie those together and Greg says, I was working on the idea of a poem where the poem itself wants to leave poetry and try another genre. Oh my goodness, you could have so much fun with that. And I think it's kind of like the, the conflict um, existing, just like it, very, very meta. Um, think about how much fun you could have, that poem kind of dipping into other genres and feeling like they belong or don't belong in the movement through that. Uh, is really fantastic. So thank you, Greg, um, for sharing that idea as well. Amazing. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Both of these are incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your work. And keep these characters uh, in mind because we're going to come back to them later. We're going to come back to these ideas. Uh, so we're going to move to the next object now. Uh, which is the Family Camera Network, which is a collaborative project that um, thinks about the idea of photography and family and chosen family, um, as it as um, is important for uh, folks who um, are LGBTQ+. Um, and personal phot photographs can document feelings about family, how family is defined, and connections to loved ones who can be separated due to dislocation. So this was an exhibit that uh, was at the ROM in 2017, and it covered uh, over 17,000 photographs, 60 albums, 37 home videos, and almost 800 other objects, as well as 42 oral history interviews. So a lot of speaking about family. Um, and this uh, happened from April 2016 to March 2019, so until fairly recently. And part of the reason why this is cool is because it's an example of collaborative museum work. So some of the things that are in museums um, the, the chain of how they got to the museum often contains sources of trauma for a lot of these communities. But by doing collaborative museum work, by asking folks, um, what, how would you like to be remembered? How would you like to document this moment? You're creating museum work that is collaborative and um, kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you're going to remember different things. You're going to remember a lot of joy and interesting uh, connections. So um, the, the idea came from uh, curator uh, Dr. Dipali Dewan, who is an art historian and curator for the South Asian Art and Culture section of the ROM. And so she wrote that the archive is the basic building block of history. So if you want to change what you write about in history, you change what you preserve. And so I really like um, this, uh, this exhibit as an example of what museum work uh, could become in the future. Um, and so many of the photos included in this collection uh, touched on movement and migration, including uh, this photo, which is the first photo that museum goers saw when they walked into the 2017 exhibit. So family camera participant Hong Lu submitted this photograph of himself at the Narita, uh, Tokyo's Narita Airport in 1979. Um, and his family came to Canada after leaving Vietnam. Uh, and he said about the, the project that it's an opportunity for us to share our narratives with the rest of the world. And so I think this is such a, a, a great photo because it shows kind of uh, the, the, act, the act of moving um, and it is both a beginning and an end and kind of an uncertain path forward. So that's what I'm really interested in uh, exploring for our next exercise. So uh, for many folks, transit hubs like airports, train spaces, uh, train stations, ferry docks, um, even moving through Union Station carries so much memory and meaning. Uh, one of my strongest memories is um, my mother grabbing my hand in a pedal jumper plane as we landed in Slocan Valley, the place where my Japanese grandmother was interned. And I'll never forget kind of the, how the propeller whirled and the crunch of the pretzels that we were given and the shaking of the whole husk of the plane and my hands were shaking too. It's just something that I can return to in an instant. Um, and so for our next exercise, I want you to look at this photo and, and think about um, 
think about what it reminds you of, a time of movement in your own life. And I want you to write me a postcard from that place that you're remembering. So think about the sights, smells, sounds, tastes, and emotions that you experienced in that migration space. Describe as much as you can and sign your postcard with your name and the year you were last there. So um, I'm going to give you, again, five minutes to write. And so thinking about sensory details, what do you hear? What do you feel? What do you see? It doesn't have to be a whole story. It can just be descriptive details. And um, just try to make it come alive for someone who wasn't there. So uh, we're going to get started on that. And I will give you five minutes to write and let you know when we're reaching the end of our time. So a postcard from a migration space that is meaningful to you. Let's get going.
So just take a couple moments to finish up your thoughts. Okay, so uh, we can come back together now. And um, if anyone wants to share in the chat, either you can maybe tell us the place that you were remembering or maybe some, a specific detail that you wrote down uh, when you were kind of brainstorming about that place. Um, or if you want to post your whole piece, that is okay too. But I'd love to see uh, little snippets of memory come together. So if anyone has um, wants to contribute some of that in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, in the meantime, uh, I can read an example uh, that I put together. Um, I address my postcard to a long lost friend. Um, and I wrote, there's no security here. They don't mind where you're going as long as you promise to come back. The air is thick with heat and the backs of my legs cling to the plastic waiting room chairs. Beside me, a weathered man unwraps a chocolate chip granola bar like it's a national secret. Someone walks in and runs into someone they know. The cycle repeats itself endlessly until we're at a family reunion that no one planned. I make eye contact with no one, focus on the destination ahead of me. It won't be quiet, but there's anonymity in the bustle of the city. So I wrote about um, a, the very small airport that we were, that we flew, um, we flew back from. Um, and I remember thinking about how different it was uh, from Toronto and how I felt like I was leaving a part of myself uh, where my grandmother had, uh, had been kept. For, uh, during the war. So it was a very meaningful place uh, to me. And I would love to hear about uh, other people's meaningful places as well, if you feel comfortable sharing it in the chat. So many of us have come from so many different places that um, I imagine that there are tons of stories, even moving through the same place, a place like uh, Pearson Airport or, or like kind of a larger hub. So many kind of threads of story come through that place in different ways. Oh, thank you so much for sharing, Anissa. Um, the skyscrapers gleam in the sunlight, reflecting light off their tall mirrored walls. The architecture seems almost a patchwork. A little apartment here, dwarfed by a building complex, complemented by some nearby and artificial natural area. Each has a dash of modern in there too. The streets are bustling with people of all races and ages and genders, and it's glorious. Those are my favorite streets as well, so I, I, I love that. Um, that sounds amazing. Um, and where, I'm wondering what place, uh, what place you're, you're describing here. New York. Wow. That yeah, that's a that's a city that I think the first time you like I've only been there one time, but I just it did really uh, impact me a lot seeing it for the first time. It seems like there's so much. Aska, thank you so much for sharing Aska. Um, so your favorite line is warehouses morph into high rises. I feel myself getting smaller, not from fear, but from being humbled. And you're talking about looking out the window on my way downtown for the first time from the go bus, the good old go bus. It really gets you where you need to go. And what a, I love the idea of warehouses morphing. Like, 
it, it kind of makes it, it feels kind of almost a natural and kind of like spec picky in, in that way. And I, I love that kind of uh, mood for uh, the city. So thank you very much, Aska, for, for sharing your work as well. Does anyone else want to share before we move to our last exercise? Oh, Sebastian, this is wonderful. Uh, so you wrote about your trip to the Dominican with friends, your first time traveling without family, and you're nervous and excited. And yes, that is a very, I think, um, strong feeling to have kind of uh, moving by yourself through unfamiliar places for the first time. Cal, thank you so much for sharing as well. Oh, and here we have such a, a, a great, uh, great kind of collection of images. My sister's red snowsuit, the flash of another tobogganer in flight. I love flight, that's such a great word there. The color cold in our nostrils, white everywhere crunching, wind moves over my Vaseline covered face, an onslaught upward, hilly hopefuls for the downslide. Cal 1978. In 1978, you have such a clear memory of this. It's really like this is a very vivid collection of images. And I'm so glad that you took us back to that moment with you. Thank you very much, Cal. So these were all amazing. And I hope that um, we're going to move to our, our final exercise now, which will bring these elements together. Um, so for our final exercise, um, we are going to take the character that we created in the first exercise in the, uh, the setting that we imagined in our second and try and put them into conversation together. So in the dodo exercise, um, our character told someone from their community uh, that they were leaving. And so now I want you to imagine them in a migration space, either leaving the place where they have the place where they were or arriving in a new place. Um, so here's the steps for this scene. So we're going to open the scene with the hustle and bustle of this space. So you might want to uh, think of a couple details that you wrote down in your list in the last exercise and try and put them into the story. Uh, next, your character realizes that they've forgotten something special to them and they can't go back to get it. And finally, as your character comes to terms with the fact that they must move forward on their own and make a new start, the scene finishes with words of strength from an unexpected place. So that might be an advertisement on the subway, a text from a long lost friend, a kind greeting of a flight attendant, whatever feels natural to you. So you're gonna put the scene together with opening with a detail about the place that, that your character is in the realization that they've forgotten something important, and then finding kind of the wisdom to move forward from an unexpected place. Uh, and the hope for this is that if you really wanted to, you could make this into a larger story. Stories don't always need huge amounts of conflict. There doesn't always have to be uh, like, a, like an accident or like, um, sometimes the best stories are kind of just little moments of conflict where characters break and grow. And I think that this is kind of one of those moments. So, so seen, they've forgotten something, and they move forward with unexpected wisdom. Does that sound good? Okay, I'm going to give you uh, five minutes for this, and then we'll come back together and, and kind of wrap up our workshop together. Sound good? Okay, let's go to the music.
And if you're looking for inspiration for this exercise, think about the, the rituals and items, big or small, that you maybe have had to go without in the pandemic. How do you kind of uh, continue forward? Where do you find that strength? Even if you don't get through everything today, all of these prompts uh, can be joined into a larger story. So maybe you start with the scene where the person explains why they're leaving and then kind of move towards the kind of the act of leaving or arriving. So these can all be built into a larger story. Or if you really connected with one of them separately, you can kind of follow that path onwards in your own direction as well. And I think uh, that's the great thing about um, kind of starting with inspiration from specific objects is that everyone interprets it their own way and kind of creates something very unique. So, um, so yes, um, I just noticed we are uh, almost out of time. So I don't know if, if folks would like to share maybe just where did they, where did you decide to have the wisdom come from or which item did they forget? Or even just the favorite line that you put together uh, in this kind of short amount of time. Um, for my, my favorite line, I think it was, I loved my younger brother's hockey bag through the automate, automated doors, mashing open and shut like the jaws of a shark. Inside the airport, the air was thick with heat. So that I took that from my brainstorming uh, exercise in number two, and I tried to avoid the eyes of friendly neighbors wondering where I was headed to. So even doing smaller exercises before tackling a larger project uh, can give you a little bit more confidence and um, kind of brainstorming material from what you can work with. So, so yeah, that's my favorite line from what I just kind of jotted down. Uh, does anyone else like to share? Uh, a line or kind of a detail that you've created in your new piece or even just something that you found um, that you found interesting about the objects we looked at today and while you're kind of thinking that over feel free to jot that in the chat but uh, writing it, uh, in, in kind of objects are great, whether they come from museums or not. Even if you search through your junk drawer or forgotten bookshelf or the back of your closet, um, you'll find things that inspire memories that you've kind of put away for a long time. And even from our childhood, we are, we're, we're always collecting things and curating 
kind of everything around us. So I think it's um, object-based writing is really helpful when you're facing any sort of kind of um, upheaval or difficulty uh, creatively. It's a great place to start because sometimes all you need is a place to start. Thank you. That was such a great workshop. I love using the prompts in that way. It's so fascinating to think about how how much could be written if there are in fact six million uh, um, artifacts inside of the museum. And as you say, I probably have six million things in my junk drawers. So <laughs> um, what a really just so amazing. And just to see what people came up with this in this short amount of time was really, really great as well. Um, are we doing a reading party on Friday? Or are we going to regroup to see what people have done? I would love to see, yeah, I would love to see what people put together. I know not all of these prompts can be fully worked through in the time that we have, but even just seeing the little snippets of creation that people came up with, I'm, I just know that with a little bit more time, there's going to be some amazing material on Friday if anyone wants to come share. Absolutely, that's great. So one of the things that we see is that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the workshop is just to get started. It's just to get past writer's block is just to get that little bit of inspiration it's just to get something onto the page and to see that you can get started that's why we really encourage people to be hands-on and to try things out in real time there's definitely something to be said for having a week to try and flesh things out a little bit and we know sometimes it takes a little bit longer but we have these weekly check-ins these um, virtual parties we call them with our artists and they're really wonderful because you get to have a little bit of feedback. So Leanne will be able to give you some feedback on what you've written if you get things to us beforehand. Um, I want to thank everybody for, especially Leanne, for you know just being so warm and leading such a, an inspiring workshop. Christian as well for um, facilitating all of this, for making it happen to our technical team. Um, and of course, for everyone who participated, um, it's great that we have weekly people who are watching a live stream, who are participating, sharing their writing, sharing what they do. I know it takes a lot of guts, especially when it is in real time, a first draft and a rough draft to share what you're doing. So many of us who are creative like to polish things a little bit before we share them publicly. So thanks to everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, um, just... Uh, mention next week's workshop. It's on staying active through storytelling. This is by uh, presented by Taking It Global. And so this is a workshop that encourages creators of all ages to share their feelings through storytelling. We've had so many great storytelling and writing workshops recently. Um, it's going to use a lot of the creative methods of storytelling that Evan Redsky, who's the workshop leader, uses for songwriting. And he'll have people writing poems um, along with him in the session. So that's going to be great. If you are, uh, if you enjoyed this and this is your first time, I encourage you to check out our archives. So if you go to communitiescreate.ca, there are sessions that are archived there on photography, on comedy, on podcasting, vocals. Um, there's so much there now, uh, and the workshops are excellent even when you're watching them back and you're, they're not necessarily in real time. So I definitely encourage you to look back at those. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna um, hand things over for the wellness mental health debrief now. Um, I do want to again acknowledge that we've got a lot of online crisis resources or a lot of crisis resources online on communitiescreate.ca as well. So for now, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you for everyone who made today happen. Um, I can't wait to see what everyone has done. If you want to share your submissions on any platform using communitiescreate, the hashtag, um, we'll keep an eye out for it. So bye to everyone who's leaving now, who's logging out now. And if anyone is staying, we'll take a moment and then it's over to you, Rachel. Thank you.